Okay, so welcome to our webinar on building a scalable HR data model with ServiceNow. Uh, my name is Brian Flora. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Beyond 20, and I'm just here to facilitate and to answer your questions and kind of help uh, help Rebecca and, and Ryan out as, as we go. So uh, for those of you who haven't been to a uh, to a Beyond 20 webinar, or for this, for those of you who are just first being exposed to Beyond 20, uh, we've been around since 2006. Beyond 20's mission here is to change work life. So, what do we mean by that? Well, it's really just a matter of of making it easier for people to do their jobs, making it easier for our clients to serve and and delight their clients. And we we do that through a combination of really three. Uh, main pillars of, uh, of service offerings. The first one is training and education. I see some names here from folks who've, who've uh, been through some of our training classes. We've got a lot of really incredible offerings in that way. Uh, everything from data science and data governance, Power BI, project management, and of course, IT service management and ITIL. We have a lot of those uh, courses as well. So you can go and check those out at beyond20.com. Uh, advisory and consulting, that's where folks come to the classes and they say, okay, that's great. I've learned the theory, but how do I do that in my organization? We're here to help with that as well. And then finally, of course, we've got the technology offerings, uh, primarily ServiceNow. So we are a ServiceNow elite partner. Uh, what we like to say is that this is how we help you institutionalize those great processes that you've developed at the or at your organization. This is how you kind of roll this out across it and across the organization and, and make these things real. Uh, so uh, the name Beyond 20, for those of you who uh, who new again, comes from a Gartner research study that was done uh, several years back. They basically found that 80% of the time when mission critical services fail, IT services, uh, they fail due to what they call people in process failures, that only 20% of it collectively, if we look at root cause, is caused by hardware failures, software failures, natural disasters, power outages, all that stuff. Uh, but the rest of it is, is uh, hey, we rolled something out new and it turns out prod and test don't look as alike as we thought they did. Or, you know, we made a change and it didn't do quite what we expected it to do. Or we had a process, but, you know, Joe didn't follow it. Uh, so that's the place where we work. We help organizations who've figured out that uh, there's really not going to be another magical box you can buy for the data center that's really going to make everything better. But when we really have to start doing the hard work of you know, changing the way work is done. That's where Beyond 20 comes in as a, a great and effective partner to help you with that. So on that note, uh, I wanna introduce our uh, illustrious uh, subject matter experts here today. Uh, first of all, starting with uh, Ryan Dinwiddie, who's our uh, chief solution architect here at Beyond 20 and a certified master architect with ServiceNow. And uh, I'll, I'll hand off to Ryan and let him take it from here. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and if you're on the West Coast like I am, hopefully you're surviving the heat wave. Um, so I, as Brian mentioned, my name is Ryan Dinwiddie. I'm a ServiceNow Certified Master Architect. I spent the last 10 years working with ServiceNow. Um, and a lot of that, the last couple of years, have really been focused on, on HR. So I've worked with some very large HR organizations to help them migrate into ServiceNow, uh, transform and change how they offer their services. Um, in kind of the, the post-COVID era here, HR has had a lot of changes um, and they've had some major changes in the last two years. So HR at scale is something a lot of organizations are needing to shift to. So it's something that we're going to be talking about today. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Onomiwuri. I'm a ServiceNow consultant. I am not dealing with the heat wave. We're up in the mountains, so it's a lot cooler up here. I've been working on the ServiceNow platform for over four years, so not quite as long as Ryan, but during that time, I've worked with several customers to either implement HRSD or just to better utilize their existing HR services within ServiceNow. Um, prior to working with ServiceNow, I also have about four years of experience working in the benefits admin side of HR, so it's been really nice diving into all the other HR features that ServiceNow offers. Um, that's it for my intro, so Ryan, do you want to kick us off? Thanks, Rebecca. Sure. So what are we here to talk about today? Um, so first off, again, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, so really, we're really going to be talking about why a scalable data model is critical to HR. Um, we're going to talk about 
uh, and dive into how the HRSD data model is set up within ServiceNow, because there is some uniqueness. Um, we're going to be talking about designing your own HR data model, um, talking about how to keep that data clean and reliable um, and high quality through governance. Um, and then we're going to be talking about how we're actually implementing the data model that you design within ServiceNow. Um, and then we're going to wrap it up like I always like to with outcomes and metrics. Um, so how do we know that our data model has been successful and is scalable? So um, I'm a fan of jumping right in. So let's talk about um, why this is so critical. So the first thing to really talk about is going to be growth and complexity. Um, so people might be tired of hearing about COVID on webinars, um, but it really is impactful and has really kind of forever changed how HR organizations work um, and how HR organizations need to meet people where they are. So the new kind of like post-COVID era, HR organizations need to be able to meet their employees anywhere and provide the same great service. So today's HR needs to serve like multinational distributed workforces, um, and that really requires a scalable data model to be able to interact with those. So um, another kind of like why a scalable model is critical um, is there's really no way around it. HR generates a ton of data, um, whether we're talking about like employee records, performance reviews, payroll information, benefits information, all of these things. Um, and we need a strategy to be able to manage that data or it's going to get out of control very, very quickly. Um, and it may already be so within parts of your organization. Um, data integration. So no HR organization only owns one system. Um, and that's like something I'm very comfortable saying because you know, with every HR organization I've worked with, you know, there are a lot of applications within that landscape. So it takes many systems to serve HR whether we're talking about an HRIS system like ServiceNow, whether we're talking about a human capital management system, like an Oracle, like a Workday, um, like ADP, whether we're talking about applicant tracking, whether that's a module within the human capital or its own system, uh, whether we're talking about payroll systems, whether we're talking about like UKG, there's so many applications out there that modern HR is made up of many systems and those systems have to talk to each other. There's kind of no way around that. So a scalable model is also going to be critical for us because um, HR relies and like modern HR needs to rely on um, analytics to make informed decisions. So there's a simple question of how do we know if HR is being effective, but there's not a simple answer to that, right? Especially when we're not able to kind of identify um, and have a standard structure for our like interactions with employees and our service to those employees, our quality metrics, all of those things. Scalable model is also gonna be really important for us when we talk about user experience. So, and when I talk about user experience, I don't mean just how do the employees feel? Um, those kind of like end users and recipients of the HR service. I'm talking about the HR professionals again as well. Um, user experience in today's world, um, in my opinion, can be a competitive advantage, especially when you've got a tight talent market. So if you're in a very tight industry, um, your ability to attract and retain top talent, um, a lot of that can come down to user experience, can come down to onboarding. So onboarding is really that first impression of your organization. Um, and if it's disorganized, disjointed, that doesn't necessarily provide a great impression of your organization. Um, so thinking about that user experience every time we're talking about and building out something within HR. So that should be kind of a, a guiding principle for us. So we've talked a little bit about the importance of a scalable model, um, but now kind of let's take a look at what that looks like within, within ServiceNow. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca. Thanks, Ryan. So when talking about data models in HR, HR case management really is the core feature. So we're gonna spend the next few minutes looking at the technical blueprint for HR case management. And we're starting with the core data stored in ServiceNow that the HR module is gonna need access to. So when you look at company, department, location data, we know that's all information that could be linked to employees at your organization, right? So an employee, they're gonna have a location. They generally work for a specific department or company within the organization. And it's important that HR has ability to associate employees with that core data. And then, of course, we see groups being used across the platform. Um, and HRSC is no different. So when a case is submitted to HR, it will need to be assigned to a group. So we'll be referencing that core data as well. 
So it's important to note too, Rebecca, when we talk about this core data, that this is one of the areas within HR that touches the ServiceNow Common Services data model. So when we talk about, you may have heard CSDM in other areas of ServiceNow, um, HR doesn't necessarily have a lot of contact when we talk about you know, larger groups of core data within ServiceNow, like the configuration management database, the CMDB, um, or the CSDM, but this is kind of one of those crossover areas between HR and CSDM. And this is that same core data that, you know, IT facilities, customer service, other users within your ServiceNow application use as well. Yeah, that's a really good call out. Um, so then after that core data, we're gonna move over here to this block on employee data. So within HR, every employee is going to have their own HR profile, and that's just a record to store confidential employee data, like their name, their contact information, and other employment history. And then that HR profile will also show other employment information, like their department, their location. So it's going back to that core data that we just looked at. Um, now, I know the HR profile probably sounds like a lot like the user record that we're all familiar with within HR, within um, ServiceNow. And the HR profile is associated with that user record, but the profile is stored confidentially within the HR scope, and it's only visible to the HR users with the required access. It's important to know too with these HR profiles that we typically see this information getting populated um, through an integration with a human capital system um, or kind of like an employee system of record. Um, mm -hmm. Very much like Rebecca had mentioned, this could be, you know, like last, last four, last six of social. Um, this could be home address, things that are like PII to make sure that we are protecting that HR agents need within ServiceNow, um, but not accessible to every user within yeah. ServiceNow. Yeah, those are good examples. And it kind of shows why it needs to be separate from just that, the user record that's already there. All right, so we've looked at some of the data that's foundational to HR case management. The next step is to look at the HR service structure. So that's this next block over here. And we'll be talking about HR services a lot over the next 30 minutes or so, but at a very high level, an HR service is just any service defined by HR and offered to employees. So when we think of an HR service, we're thinking of things like a leave request or a benefit enrollment that an employee would need to submit to HR. Um, every HR service that an organization provides does need to be defined and categorized when it's built in ServiceNow. And that first step in categorization is to link the service to a single center of excellence, which you can see in that top blue box there. And this might be the first time you've heard the term center of excellence. We'll be talking about that a lot in a lot more detail as well. Um, but just again, at a high level, each center of excellence is an HR case table that represents a functional discipline within HR. So here we're thinking of functional areas like payroll or total rewards or workforce admin, um, those types of areas. So from there, every center of excellence will contain more specific topic categories and then topic details, and the HR service will be organized within that structure. So that's kind of the organization of where the HR service sits. And then if you look over to the right of that HR service block, we see that each service can also be associated with a template, a record producer, and service activities. And those are really key features within that service. And the template is going to be used to set fields on the HR case that gets created from that service request. And then record producers, just like anywhere else in the platform, are used to collect data related to that service and then to submit the actual request. And then service activities define the fulfillment steps that are going to be on that resulting case. So from there, we're going to move down to that HR case data that's going to come from the uh, HR service. So Going back to the HR service, HR has defined the service, the employee has gone to the portal, they've requested that service, and now we have an HR case that was created for HR to start working on. So we're gonna start looking at all the details from that resulting HR case here. So looking at how it connects to the HR service, we're gonna start with these fields here in gray. Um, every center of excellence has specific fields relevant to that functional area. Again, thinking about workforce admin or benefits and how those areas may need different case fields. So based on the center of excellence or the COE that's tied to the service, those fields will be available on the resulting case, plus any checklist that were defined on the service. And then we're going to move over to the right. Um, any data that was pre-filled in the HR template will also populate on the corresponding case. And then any data that was captured in the record producer will be available on the HR case as well. Next, we have service activities. 
Uh, they were defined in the HR service when that was built, and they're going to trigger any necessary approvals, any child cases, or tasks that need to be part of the fulfillment process for the HR case. And now we're going to jump all the way over to the left side of this block. Um, so we're going to also see references to the open for user and the subject person. And that subject person is just the person who the case is about. So it may or may not be the same as the open for user and then the assigned to user. And all of those fields are going to be referencing back to that user record, to that core, the um, employee data that we looked at earlier. And then the fulfillment instructions and assignment groups that we see down here. Those are going to take us into some conditional field po population functionality that we're going to look at in our final block. So in this final block, we see some examples of conditional field population, and these use rules to evaluate all new newly created cases. And then based on the conditions in that case, they can populate fulfillment instructions and assignments um, just based on the details from that case. So those are more kind of outside of the initial service structure, and they're just conditional rules set up. So that wraps up the technical blueprint for HR case management. I know that was a lot of detail, but Ryan's going to take us a little further into the HRSD data model. Thanks, Rebecca. And this is, <clears throat> I just want to make a quick second to call it. This is a really important slide. Um, and one of the kind of the bigger barriers that I've seen with HR organizations starting on ServiceNow is kind of understanding this data structure. Um, so this is a, a great kind of overview and a great slide to kind of bookmark for later on um, if you're newer to ServiceNow or thinking about moving on to HRSD. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so very much as Rebecca had talked about um, how the HR services are structured, um, let's talk about how ServiceNow Center of Excellence data model works. So this is really gonna be how the tables in the database are configured. Um, this is a little bit more of a technical slide, but it's really important to kind of understand um, how this works because it's gonna have a direct impact on how your HR services are structured, um, which we're gonna talk about next. So let's start with how this works within the database. So within um, the ServiceNow database, there is an HR core or an HR core case table. Um, that's gonna be the parent case table within the HR scoped application. Um, so this table, again, within that scoped application, when I say scoped application, I mean um, that this is essentially walled off within your ServiceNow environment and that you need special access to get into it just because you can log into ServiceNow doesn't mean you can get into the special HR area. Um, so from this parent case table, we have um, extended uh, or ServiceNow has extended individual tables to create separate center of excellence or COE tables. Um, each have their own uses. So when we talk about COE tables, um, these are going to be actually separate tables within the database. Um, and because they have, because they're separate tables, they can have their own security, their own behavior, their own configuration. Um, and most of that data rolls up to the HR core case table for ease of reporting. Um, there's a big caveat there of assuming whoever is running the reports against the HR case table can see that data. Um, so it's really important to note. Um, one good example of this might be like the Global Mobility Center of Excellence. And on that Global Mobility Center of Excellence, we might see HR services around like international travel requests, visa requests, um, those kinds of things. So we're going to talk about how the HR services align to COEs here in a few minutes. Um, but these are just going to be the out-of-box COEs that we have available to us. Um, and there are two more COE tables that exist within their own separate scoped applications. Um, so employee relations is um, the most sensitive HR data that we have out there. So it's going to live in its own center of excellence table. So again, just because I'm an HR agent and have access to the HR application doesn't necessarily mean I can see employee relations cases. I need to be an HR agent and an employee relations agent to be able to get access to those cases. Um, and then the final one that we're going to touch on a little bit is the lifecycle events. So if you do have HRSD um, Enterprise within ServiceNow, you have the access to the on and offboarding and the transitions. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and talk about how to set up your data model if eventually um, it is a goal or a roadmap item for you to bring that onboarding um, within ServiceNow. Okay. So within the COE model, um, Rebecca talk, talked on this a little bit, what we're going to start to kind of dig into the details. 
Um, we have the uh, COE as a way to categorize the HR service um, and the services the, that the that HR offers to the organization. Um, so service identification and classification may be one of the harder activities, um, at least in my experience it has been, um, because it sometimes requires adjusting thinking a little bit for, um, for HR folks in order to, to think about like, if we're going from just kind of like a maybe like a shared mailbox or like a legacy tool where we're just responding to questions, um, it's a bit of a mindset shift to think about um, what services does HR offer, how do we classify those, and then how do we get people to the right service without just sending in you know general inquiry. So um, this is again a really important exercise because this is going to be um, classifying how those services are offered. Um, and let me get my little laser pointer out here. So when we talk about COE again, this is that table within that database um, that we had just talked about. And when we talk about that topic category, topic detail, Rebecca's gonna get into those a little bit more um, later on, but I like to think of these really as like a category subcategory. That's just essentially what they are is we're categorizing the services at a category level and then a subcategory level. And it may be at the bottom of the pyramid, this HR service, but it is by far the most important. Um, so each HR service has its own kind of automation like Rebecca had talked about. Um, it has its own auto assignment. It has its own specific fulfillment flow. It has its own unique data elements. So it may sit kind of at the bottom of the pyramid, but in my opinion, it is one of the most important pieces of this. Um, so let's see what this looks like in action. So let's take the, the payroll center of excellence here. And again, that's going to be that payroll table within the database. Um, if we had some HR services, um, like payroll discrepancy, direct deposit setup, or direct deposit discrepancy, um, these, these services might be something that an employee would reach out saying, hey, my paycheck is wrong, or you guys direct deposit in the wrong account, or my direct deposit was half of what my paycheck should be, right? Those kinds of things. Um, so it's an important note here that like these names um, are what HR calls these services. Um, and these services may be exposed on the portal for self-service, um, but we're not going to expose these names, um, the HR names directly to the employee. So we're going to talk about it a little bit later on, but um, we're going to be exposing these services in the employee's language. So in the portal, there is what we talk mm -hmm. about content taxonomy that says, you know, I have payroll discrepancy, but what does that mean and what does an employee in my organization call a payroll discrepancy? Um, so that's just kind of an important note that when we see this center of excellence, topic category, topic detail, HR service model, that's internal HR. So that's how HR is going to classify those. We don't necessarily need to think about the employee because we're going to have a crosswalk for what the employee sees through the portal. So it's just kind of an important note that like, you know, I talk about user experience, but this is one area where we can ignore end user experience because this isn't important to them. We have a way to crosswalk it already. So for these HR services, we would probably categorize those as, you know, payroll administration. Um, and then we would probably have kind of a subcategory of direct deposit. Um, so with that, Rebecca is going to dive into this model a little more in detail on topic category, topic detail, and HR service. Thanks, Ryan. So yeah, we're just going to look through these same types of examples that Ryan just walked through. But we're going to spend a little bit more time looking at how that categorization works. And Ryan did a really good job explaining what a center of excellence is. So we're jumping right down to that next level of the topic category. Uh, the topic category is going to be your first level of categorization under each center of excellence. And when looking at the structure here, it's important to keep in mind that each center of excellence can have multiple topic categories, but every topic category is always going to only be linked to a single center of excellence. So branching down, it can branch out as much as you need to, but when you go up, it's going to be that single flow up to a single center of excellence. And in the examples that Ryan just talked through, that center of excellence was payroll. So following that same example of a topic category nested, or a topic category nested under that uh, center of excellence would just be payroll administration. So that's kind of very general categorization. And then from there, a topic category is going to be defined even further. And that's where we get to the next slide where we look at the topic detail. So that next level of categorization is this topic detail. And as the name implies, it's just giving you more detail on that categorization for an HR service. So following that same example, um, we saw that the center of excellence was payroll. We went down to a category of payroll administration, and now the more specific topic detail is just direct deposit. 
And it's going to follow that same organizational structure that I just talked about. So every topic detail is only going to link up to a single topic category and then into a single center of excellence. And then from there, we're going to be able to move into that final um, HR service that we've been talking about. And again, like Ryan said, I want to emphasize this again, even though it's last in our list of categorization, this is the starting point for HR service delivery. So when you're working through categorization, you don't start from center of excellence and work your way down. You start at the HR service first, and then you go up and find out which center of excellence it needs to go in and then drill down to category and topic detail. So in the example that we were going through with payroll, we'll stick with that. So center of excellence of payroll, topic category of payroll administration, topic detail of direct deposit. And now we have an HR service example called paycheck discrepancy. So paycheck discrepancy is what the employee is going to report. And as we saw earlier in our blueprint, once the employee goes into the portal, they submit a paycheck discrepancy. A corresponding HR case will be created with all of the necessary fulfillment steps. And then that case is going to live within that payroll center of excellence or that payroll case table that Ryan's been talking about based on how we've categorized it here. And pretty shortly after this, we're going to be looking at why it's so important that the resulting payroll case is tied to that specific payroll center of excellence. Uh, real quick, we have a question here from an audience member. Uh, which COE or COEs would you recommend starting with when implementing HRSD in ServiceNow? Is there a best practice guidance on that? Well, Brian Paul had a list earlier on the slide, and those are generally going to be the out-of-box uh, COEs available to you. So as you're going through, I mean, you want to evaluate what's already available out-of-box. And then, you know, just depending on what services you offer, you do have the option of turning off specific COEs if they're not applicable to your organization. Um, but you're going to want to, like we've been talking about, start with those services. Start with the services that you offer. And if you find services that fit into all of these different COEs, you can start with all of the COEs. You don't have to limit your starting um, starting center of excellence options. Um, but again, you're going to start with your services and find out what you need based on what services you offer. Ryan, do you have okay, anything to so add it'll to that? Okay, so it'll be derivative from your service catalog then, basically, right? Yeah. yeah, the one recommendation I have is don't start with payroll. Um, payroll <laughs> benefits, those are some of the more difficult ones, um, especially because... It, they're all over the map for organizations, whether they process those internally, whether they're outsourced. Um, <clears throat> I would think about like very much like Rebecca had mentioned, identifying services um, and thinking about those services that maybe have more, more simpler fulfillment tasks, uh, maybe those that don't involve vendors, those that don't involve integrations, um, but still identifying all the HR services you have up front. Okay. So let's talk about uh, what the benefits of that kind of center of excellence model is. So um, the benefits of the COE model is it allows HR to, to organize that work based on functional discipline. Um, so what does that really mean? It means that we can get the, the work to the right people the first time. Um, so HRSD application, as we mentioned, uses separate case tables um, to help ensure privacy and control process. Um, when creating a new, a new HR case, um, the table or center of excellence defines where that HR case is going to be saved within the database. Um, and then each HR service is, is associated to only one center of excellence table, like Rebecca had mentioned. Um, so the HR tables are in a scoped application or they're kind of encapsulated. Um, so only users with approved roles may access um, cases and um, separate cases, separate case tables allow for more security around which departments or groups have access to specific data. Um, so centers of excellence can be secured. You can secure within center of excellence again as well using um, out-of-box configuration. Um, a good example of this might be HR for HR. So that, that's one of those questions that comes up quite a bit is what happens when I have allegations against somebody within HR or when somebody has somebody within HR has a payroll question um, and they may be a payroll agent. So we have the ability with out-of-box configuration to be able to lock that down and control access without heavy customization. Um, another good example of that might be payroll discrepancy. So if we have payroll discrepancy, we may be looking at um, salary information. We may be looking at you know paycheck amount, gross pay amount. Those may be on the HR case themselves, 
Um, and because of that, only the payroll group should have access to that. Somebody in benefits shouldn't necessarily have access to that. Somebody in you know, HR, HRIS or HRIT should not have access to that. So um, another reason for benefits of that COE model is um, to have consistency for metrics and reporting. Um, so we can report on that COE or that micro level um, or higher up across the organization at that HR case level or macro level. Again, the caveat is, you know, assuming I have access, but one of the biggest benefits in my opinion is gonna be um, with those services defined, we have the ability to drive automation. So if we know exactly what the user is asking about, then we can have kind of a tailored fulfillment process per service, per COE. Um, and that tailored fulfillment process could potentially involve um, less agents or no agents at all, depending on the needs um, and depending on the integration. So a simple question of like, when is my next pay date? Maybe that's a simple integration to the payroll system to pull that data back um, and answer that question automatically without having to get an agent involved. Or maybe I need an employment verification. So I can kick off that process, have some automation, have documents automatically generated, um, and then available for download for that employee. So depending on um, what service we have and what fulfillment we have, we have that ability to, to drive that automation. Okay, so when designing our data model, let's talk about some important factors. Um, one of the most important factors is what's on the roadmap. Um, so if we know where we're going, um, we'll have all of that information. So a good example of this is, is your benefits currently outsourced? Or is it currently outsourced and it's coming in house? Um, so what are what is HR leadership? What is the CHRO wanting to do with the organization? Um, another big question is: Is merger and acquisition common in your industry and organization? Um, if that's the case, then our data model definitely needs to be flexible um, to be able to accommodate you know many data sources to be able to accommodate. Um, just random data coming in from other organizations because their data is gonna be all over the map. So we need to make sure that we're rationalizing that data. So Rebecca mentioned this again, um, but what COE fields? So it's important to know what is being reported on um, and what's important for us. And we're making sure that we're using those fields wisely um, and with specific intent. Um, and this is a big one. So when we talk about HCM data, so what data needs to come to and from the HCM application? So we talked about this again a little bit, but you know, what data does an agent need um, to be able to stay within ServiceNow? So to be able to fulfill a specific case type, um, what do they need so they're not having to swivel chair into another organization or in a, sorry, into another application? Um, and Finally, um, what other applications, again, we talk about the HR landscape, um, there are many applications, but what other applications do we need integrations into? Um, do we need benefits? Do we need payroll information? Do we need applicant tracking? Um, what other systems, background checks, like those kinds of things, what other integrations do we need um, for, for our, our HR data model? So every organization is different and there's no one answer to any of these. Um, but with this, keeping this in mind, let's talk about um, with the HR services being the heart of the data model, um, Rebecca's gonna dive into kind of like how we look at the HR services again, how we identify and classify those a little bit more. Yeah, so we've talked quite a bit about how HR services um, are the starting point for HR service delivery. So like Ryan said, we're going to look through a few examples and hopefully this will kind of fill in any gaps and paint the picture of what the structure looks like as we see these examples. So the first HR service example that we're looking at here is going to be for the pay air. Um, so when categorizing that, that service, the first step is to look at those out-of-box COEs that Ryan mentioned earlier and then determine which one of those COEs or center of excellence that service should follow under. Uh, in this scenario, the service is obviously related to payroll. It's handled by the payroll team. So it makes sense that that service would fall under that payroll COE. So we're going to first put it there, and then we're going to define it a little bit further into the next categories. Um, so the first topic category that we're looking at in this example would be just that general payroll administration. It's a very high level topic category, um, but then we do want to get a little bit more specific into that next topic detail. So under payroll administration, we've linked that HR service to a topic detail called discrepancy. 
And then we would just follow that same logic for each HR service that has been defined by your organization. So in our next example here, we have an HR service called Recruiting Event. And this has been associated with the Talent Management Center of Excellence. And then going down the list, we've got the Talent Acquisition as the topic category and Recruiting as the topic detail. And then looking at our next example, we've got Cobra Enrollment Service. It's first going to be placed under that Total Rewards Center of Excellence, and then further categorized under Benefits for the category, and then Benefits Enrollment for that topic detail. And then in our last example, um, employee, Employment Verification Service is going to be the actual HR service, and then that's going to be placed under that Workforce Administration Center of Excellence and then employee data management as the category and employment verification as that topic detail. So as an organization goes through the exercise of defining their services, they're going to be creating and editing topic categories and topic details as they go, just to make sure everything fits in a logical place for your organization. Um, Ryan, one of the things that has come up for me in the past is as this is being built out, some customers ask about creating their own center of excellence, maybe for special types of services that they want to add. So how would you respond in that situation where a customer wants to just create a new service excellence and start from there or a center of excellence and start from there? That's a good question. It's come up for me a few times too. And the, the good practices answer from ServiceNow and from us is to not do it. Um, you can reuse an existing um, center of excellence. So there is, there's a corporate communications center of excellence um, that usually ends up being our catch-all because usually corporate communications falls under marketing and not HR for most organizations. Um, so typically we'll end up reusing a center of excellence if there are specific needs. Um, but for the most part, the good, the good example and the good rationale is to not create our own center of excellence. Um, but we do have full control on that topic category, topic detail. Um, so, and the center of excellence isn't really exposed to the customer, um, to those end users. So it's kind of important to note that we can categorize those services however we want. So it makes sense for HR, um, but we don't typically create uh, additional centers of excellence. Okay. So um, talking about kind of continuing that data model here, if your organization is going to be talking about moving to HRSD Enterprise, which is, again, that on offboarding and transitions, um, there's some foundational elements that need to be addressed before we get there. Um, so the first one is on offboarding touches every part of the organization, whether it is IT, facilities, access management, telecom, procurement, everybody, for the most part, is involved um, in on and offboarding. So making sure that we have a strong service catalog with good fulfillment processes, um, that's going to be key. So the other thing that's kind of important or really important for, for the foundation for enterprise um, is making sure that we have solid integrations into human capital and applicant tracking. So whether that applicant tracking is its own system or whether it's a module within your HCM, um, having that strong sol solid foundation for that um, is going to be really important. So um, mobile. So the best end user experience for onboarding with ServiceNow involves mobile devices. So that's something that has to be taken into account now um, or early on as part of your strategies if you're looking at moving towards HRSD Enterprise is the organization needs a strategy for mobile, it needs to be ready for mobile, and it needs to be rolled out um, as part of this, if not before. Um, final foundational piece is um, organizational change management. So changing onboarding um, is a huge organizational change, and that organizational change needs to be managed through OCM. So making sure that all of the stakeholders are involved there, again, because HR may own the onboarding process, but they don't necessarily um, manage every single aspect of it. IT manages some of it. Um, access controls manages some of it, procurement manages some of it, facilities may manage some of it, right? So just because HR may, um, may kind of like kick off the process and kind of own parts of it doesn't necessarily mean they can do it alone. Um, so it's important to note that everybody else is involved in that as well. Okay, so one of the big questions is we've got kind of um, like our data model defined, we understand the data model within ServiceNow, so how do we keep this data clean um, within that model. So we're going to talk about kind of some higher level principles when it comes to, to data quality and governance. Um, the first part of it is data security. So HR has, again, some of the most sensitive and most secure data. So we need to make sure we have standards in place um, to establish and protect that data. 
Um, and as we've seen in the news a lot on the lot and a lot lately, um, and you probably get notices, unfortunately, it seems like on a monthly basis um, from some organization that, you know, some part of your identity has been stolen. Um, we're wanting to make sure we're preventing that as much as we can. So um, we can only use this data if we can trust it. Um, so we need to make sure we have integrity in our data uh, and changes to that data need to be managed and governed. Um, and you probably already have some sort of like master data management process within your HR organization. This is just kind of an extension of that. Um, so standards and consistency. This is especially important, like I talked about earlier, if your organization um, deals with a lot of mergers and acquisitions, um, making sure that we have data standards and data consistency, um, wanting to make sure we're documenting how and where HR data is used. Um, it's also going to be a defense for us against unauthorized use of that data. So data integrations, um, this is going to be all about standards for me. And if you have enterprise architecture teams, this is a good way to get them involved um, and start to document where the data is going in and out of HR systems. Um, this also adds traceability um, to our HR data and understand exactly where it is at all times. Um, and that leads us directly into accountability. So we need to know who owns that integration, who owns the data, and who has clear accountability for that data management. Um, because if um, it's one of those things that if everybody is accountable, nobody's accountable, right? There needs to be a single person to point to, to say, you need to approve, you need to manage this data. So regulatory compliance. Um, if you work in industries that are controlled um, by specific parts of the government, whether it's FDA, whether it's ITAR, whether it is um, you've got specialized workforces, those kinds of things, um, making sure that we are complying with any of that data management. If you're not just in the US, if you have to deal with GDPR um, and other international data regulations, important to know that. Um, the next question that we have when we talk about regulatory compliance is, do we need to have legal holds on our data? Is our data subject to you know, retention periods? Are there maximum retention periods? So there's just a lot of regulatory information um, that comes around our, our HR data that we need to have clearly documented and identified. So we've talked about the reason why and the theory, but let's see how this actually works within ServiceNow. So I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca. Awesome. So yeah, let's take a look at that implementation process for HR services and ServiceNow. So the first step is always to identify the services that HR offers or that they plan to offer. So like Ryan mentioned earlier, maybe there are some things right now that are just kind of handled through email requests that come in and they haven't really been defined as a service. So those are going to be defined here in this first step as well. And then just making sure that all of those HR services are being documented. And of course, this is something that will evolve over time. So it's not necessarily going to be a complete list at the beginning, but you do want to try to get as close as you can to that full list of services that are offered. Um, so then once you have identified those services, the next step is to go through each one and identify some of those key features related to that service. So you want to think about who's going to be responsible for fulfilling the request and also think about any particular security that should be applied to that kind of request. And when thinking of security, it's helpful to think about what kind of data would either be in the request itself or what data that HR agent is going to need to access in order to fulfill the request. Um, so think about questions like, would the request contain allegations against other employees? Would it involve um, an employee's medical information? Would there be payroll related data involved? So by addressing those questions, it really helps to prepare for that next step where we are actually selecting the center of excellence or that COE. Um, so this next step here is um, yep, selecting the center of excellence. So now that we've identified the fulfillment and the security related to that particular service, we can select the appropriate center of excellence that it's going to be linked to. And one of the things that Ryan was talking about earlier was, you know, just like the sensitivity of employee relations, relations cases. So when you see things like a, a, an allegation or maybe a disciplinary action, those are going to be, you know, red flags that, hey, this definitely needs to fall into that employee relations COE. So you're, again, you're going to be selecting this based on those types of security and fulfillment type answers that you gave earlier. And then from here, we're going to start categorizing those services. So we're going to be um, categorizing based on the topic categories and the topic details that we've already discussed quite a bit. Um, while going through the exercise, you do want to keep in mind what Ryan mentioned this earlier as well, that these categorization 
that you are applying, that these are just internal. It's internal categorization, not visible to the employee. So you would just want to build this classification however it makes sense best to your HR organization. And then once you have categorized it, the next thing that you want to really consider are those center of excellence fields. So think about the things that you may need to report on for the resulting HR case. And keep in mind that every center of excellence does have its own fields that are already available on the resulting case record. Um, but think about whether or not those fields are going to, you know, satisfy the requirements that you have or custom fields are going to be needed in order to complete the reporting that you need for each type of case. Um, the next step that we have here is related to external data. And I think Brian has some key things that he wanted to call out here. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, and we got, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but <clears throat> it's important to note that the goal is going to be when we're using something like ServiceNow as our system of engagement, we want to keep the HR agent in ServiceNow. So what data do we need to pull in from human capital management, from applicant tracking, from payroll, from benefit systems? Um, because thinking about how we can keep that HR agent in ServiceNow and engaged, we don't necessarily want to slow them down to say, oh man, I got to open up Workday, I got to open up success factors to find this specific piece of information. And if I don't already have it open, it's going to take me a few minutes to log in. I need to go through single sign-on. I need to go through MFA. Like it, the idea being, is it easy enough for us to pull that data in through an integration? So all, all the HR agent has to do is bring up that profile and say, oh, yep, next payroll date is you know the 14th of next month. I can reply back. I can close the case. We're done. Um, those kinds of things. So the idea being is what information for that specific service do we need to put into service now to keep the agent um, in, in service now and focused on getting that case solved as quickly as possible. Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. And then our final step here is the fun part. This is the implement step. Um, so once everything has been built, you can go ahead and implement that. And then you just repeat this process as needed so that you can build out all of the HR services that have been identified. So this is that high level um, overview of the implementation process. So now that we've walked through this, Ryan's gonna take us a little bit further and talk about some of the outcomes and metrics that we want to consider. Thanks Rebecca. And this process sounds very simple, right? Okay, so let's talk about outcomes and metrics. So I kind of like to, to end um, our, our webinars on how do we know if we've been successful um, with implementing this process? So um, now this is a bit of an eye chart, so I apologize for that, but this will be available um, in the follow-up and in the recording as well that'll be sent out. Um, but one of my um, kind of like big encouragement here is to say, focus on outcomes. So think about the things that, you know, we want from our from our HRIS tool, something like ServiceNow. Um, and I'm gonna start, let me get my little laser pointer right here. I'm gonna start with kind of the first outcome. So maybe one of the first outcomes is we want to reduce HR case volume. So maybe one of the outcomes that we have is reducing HR case volume because we want to free up our HR agents to have more time with employees because maybe we wanna offer a higher quality of service. We wanna offer more white glove service and we don't wanna adjust our staffing level. So one of the ways to be able to do that is to reduce that HR case volume. And once we have our outcomes, then we can start to define our metrics. Um, and our metric here may be something like, you know, it's it's a pure simple, like, is it an up, down, high, low for HR case volume? Um, and then we can look at some suggested improvements on there. So one of the ways that we can re reach those suggested improvements would be to think about our HR case um, and our HR data model and how scalable it is. So um, with that, let's talk about the HR, the HR data model. So um, if we're able to correctly classify HR services, then we're able to start to take that next step of automation. So I know we've talked about this or I've talked about this a few times earlier today, um, but if we're able to get the employee to the right HR service and the HR service is able to be requested and fulfilled without involving an HR agent, um, then we're able to look at you know, are we meeting that outcome? We are freeing up HR agents by um, not having them involved in the fulfillment process because we're able to help those employees self-serve or we're able to automate um, that kind of self-service uh, from, from the HR application. And again, a lot of that comes back to the scalable data model of what are the services that are defined, but also what data do we have in service now that's available from other applications? Um, like if I've got questions around when is my next pay date? 
or like I talked about automating that employment verification, um, those kinds of things that you know may be involved with other tools. Um, and we're again, keeping that system of engagement as ServiceNow, um, but having those backend integrations that the end users don't even know about to the other applications within that, that HR landscape. So with that, um, Brian, did we have any additional questions that came in? Um, there is one, and the question is, uh, what, do, what do people often get wrong when they implement this? What are the, what's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the question. That is a great question. Um, so I'll, I'm going to start, and then I'll turn it over to Rebecca based on experience. Um, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a hard question to answer um, because I'll give you the consultant's answer if it depends, which isn't a great answer. Um, but what I've seen most commonly is um, trying to go and again this again I'll, cause, I'll clarify this answer, but trying to go too fast. So there is a lot of um, intentional effort that needs to happen to identify those HR services. Um, so those HR services, I know that Rebecca and I have kind of been beating that drum for the last hour, but um, those are the key to how the HR service model works within ServiceNow. So skipping over parts of that process, not giving that process enough due diligence, um, because that's core and foundational to the data model, that can cause ripples and problems in the future um, for having to like realign the organization. And if we're realigning the organization, if we're having to shift COEs, we then have to go back potentially and rework security. We have to move case data. Like there's a lot of things and a lot of impacts that happen there. Um, so that's kind of what I've seen. And I'll turn it over to you, Rebecca, if you've got any additional thoughts there. Yeah, it's kind of similar. I think one of the things I've seen a lot is just the temptation to kind of uh, jump in and maybe customize based on a single type of service, you know, adding in custom fields, making sure everything is particular to that service instead of kind of taking a step back at the big picture and seeing how you can leverage what's out of box and how those can apply across the board to multiple services. Um, so kind of like Ryan mentioned too, just making sure that things are categorized cleanly and that you're able to leverage as much out of box as opposed to doing a bunch of customization based on maybe one type of um, particular service. I think that's that's one area to focus on is just making sure that you're seeing the big picture and leveraging what you can that's out of box. That's a great, that's a great point, Rebecca. And that's something that um, you just kind of gave me a thought around like what's unique about the COE model is you have most likely within your HR organization, people that own the processes. Um, so like I've got somebody that owns payroll, I've got somebody that owns benefits um, and getting the, getting all those people together in a room, getting them to see to eye to eye, and understanding the model, getting them to work together um, can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge depending on the organization. So that's, that's another great call out is there needs to be a strong relationship with HR leadership um, to make sure that we are, you know, understanding the importance of this model and helping to make sure that we're working together um, and people are looking beyond their specific area within ServiceNow. So that's a, a really great point, Rebecca. So it looks like we have a follow-up question. I feel like uh, somebody's got a very uh, specific problem they're trying to get to. Uh, what if you've already put HRSD in place and it's not working very well? Um, maybe you went too fast the first time. How do you pull back and redo it? Well, that's a good question. That's another it depends. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll start with, you know, I, I would think like some, some service rationalization. So um, understanding what you currently have versus the services that that you offer. So I think that's a it's a prime opportunity to have some workshops there to think about like getting everybody in a room together, getting everybody to talk um, and think about the services that are offered. And once you kind of have a better idea of, you know, I don't want to say back to the drawing board um, because there is going to be some rework, but some of the stuff is probably going to be true and accurate is making sure that we're able to identify those services, get those services well in hand. And then that gives you a starting point to figure out what the gap is between um, where you're currently at and where you should be. And then starting to have individual plans to kind of potentially remediate um, if needed those centers of excellence. Maybe that case data is, you know, I hate the term abandoned, but maybe it's left where it is. And then we start fresh and have to deal with some, you know, some potential reporting. Um, it just kind of depends on the situation because like if things have been bad for three or four years, 
that's a lot of data to move. But if things have just been a little rocky for six months, um, maybe there's enough time that it's easy to course correct, slide some of that case data over so you don't have to do any adjustments on reporting. Um, and I'll, I'll pause there, Rebecca, if you've got additional thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, again, along the same lines, um, we've been talking so much about starting with services. So I think the same thing, if you have to kind of go back and revamp, again, you're going to start with services and start with how that's been classified, making sure that there is um, just a really clear understanding of what's being offered. And Ryan kind of mentioned this before too, that you want to start with what's easiest to address. So if you can kind of identify a group of services, maybe that rolled up onto a single COE, just start with those, you know, start revamping those, get a good process in place, and then you can start, you know, kind of applying that to the other COEs and the services offered within those. Fair enough. Okay, well, I think um, we're, we've, we're coming up toward the uh, end of the hour here. So unless there are any other questions, I think, um, We'll go ahead and wrap up. Looks like there's one more follow-up question. Any creative offbeat COEs that we've built beyond the out-of-box ones? I'll say no, I haven't. I, I haven't ventured beyond the out-of-box. Always strongly recommended to stay with what's already offered, but maybe you have some more create, creative options there, Ryan. Uh, if that wasn't really incredibly creative, but I think one of the, the, the stranger ones was um, a one project I had, we repurposed the corporate communications center of excellence um, and moved the training team in there because they were part of the HR organization. Um, this was in a for a pharmaceutical company. So <clears throat> training was really important because it had direct ties to FDA regulations. Um, so they we ended up building out like a whole huge center of excellence for them um, under corporate communications that was rebranded as training. Um, <clears throat> but that was kind of like one of the probably the most unique and probably the most like I'll put air quotes around the word custom because it was more configuration based. Um, but that was kind of one of the more unique areas of of reusing a COE for something that was, you know, beyond its intended purpose because we didn't want to we didn't want to have that customization and technical debt to build a specific COE for them. But sure. Great question. Yeah, the element of technical debt is always an important thing to uh, to keep in mind. So, uh, as always, if you want to know more about uh, this or many other topics, head to beyond20.com slash blog. We've got a lot of great content there, as well as the resource section on the site. You'll find a lot of helpful ServiceNow white papers, uh, links to other webinars, and uh, and just general helpful uh, helpful content to help you do your job a little bit better. So thank you very much to everybody for attending and we'll go ahead and leave it there. Have a great day.